there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. These days, more gardeners than ever are adding fruit trees to their plants. Since now is the best time to plant, extension fruit specialist Jim Comis selects a few easy ones to grow. Plus, get his tips to keep your fruit trees healthy and productive. On tour, let's see how new plants get started. Beautiful white roots. That one's ready to go to a gallon pot right there. Oh, it's a pretty sight. That's a celebration every day at Joss Growers, bringing new plants into the world. We probably grow about 401 gallons and um, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 120,000 fives. I've always grown plants and I've always uh, wanted to do this for, uh, for a living and, and I moved to Central Texas where, where I could do that. I started in my backyard uh, like a lot of people do and uh, 15 years ago we moved out here. Here is 12 acres on an old cotton field in Georgetown where David Scott started growing plants wholesale to landscapers. Now he has multiple greenhouses and a staff to assist with the demand for native and adapted plants that understand what Texas is all about, even in drought. As quickly as we could, we started growing native perennials and, and ornamental grasses. That was Jim Lidgey's dream job. I bought my first house in 1988. and wanted to plant a tree. And I bought all the wrong trees. They all died. <laughs> And I became fairly frustrated with that. And then one Saturday, after looking in my backyard with a bunch of dead plants, I found Central Texas Gardener was on. And I, I think it was probably Scott Ogden and Jill Noakes and Cheryl McLaughlin, you know, back in 20 years ago. And they were sort of talking about native plants. And I started looking alongside the road. And it was like, well, look at this beautiful little yellow flower. I had no idea what it was. But there it is. Nobody's watering it. Nobody's pruning it or spraying it. And it's growing just fine. Why can't I grow that plant in my house? So I started going to local nurseries and looking for native plants and got hooked on growing things. Jim found a new career at Barton Springs Nursery where his love of growing kept on growing. That personal germination led him to Joss Growers where thousands of plants find life through his hands every year. It usually starts with either a seed or cutting or a division. And my favorite is to start things with, from seed but it's always not practical to do things that way, like salvia, gray guys, and rosemaries, crepe myrtles, those all need to be started by cutting. He starts some plants from tissue cultures to maintain their true identity. Yuccas, grasses, annuals, vegetables, lots of herbs, basil's real easy from seed, verbenas are easy from seed, mealy blue sage always comes from seed. After cleaning the seeds or scraping them from grasses, Jim plants them in common flats until they're rooted. And keep it at the appropriate moisture level, which is moist, but not soaking wet. It should be still moist in the evening, but the, the very top of it should just start to be a little bit dry in the evening, so there's not a lot of condensation, and you don't want your little seedlings to have a lot of water on the leaves or on the stems in the evening time. The soil should be wet, but the plant itself, the, the seedlings should be dry by the time the sun goes down. We'll take them out of those common flats and very gently separate them apart, trying to keep as much root as possible. And after they come out of the seed flats, we put them up into these 36 count flats. It's in a nice, loose, well-draining peat base mix. And then at this point, where they get those beautiful white roots coming out the bottom and all up and down the sides, it still needs a little more rooting to be ready to go to a gallon, but that is a a beautiful sight right there, nice white roots. And if there's kind of brown roots or anything, that's not a good sign. It usually means you're giving them too much water and the roots are starting to rot. And when they're just like this, it just makes me want to touch them. Someday, these yucca rostratas won't be quite as touchable, though David got these mature ones from another grower. Plants from cutting start in a mist house. And this pink myroporum is probably ready to come off the mist table. Oh yes, it's not fully rooted, but it's got enough white roots to where it'll, the cutting can sustain itself with the roots that it has. It'll be time for it to get less water. And we'll move it over to the other side where it's warm and humid, and I'll just hand water it and bring it along that way until it's ready to go to a gallon. And then we bring them over here to harden them up. In the hardening off greenhouse, the plants adjust to about 75% humidity. 
So what we do is we go from 100% humidity and just kind of back it down slowly. Then when we plant them into the, into the finished containers, um, depending on how quickly we need them to finish, uh, they'll either go directly outside, which will be a slower finish, or they'll go into a greenhouse, one of these finishing greenhouses, and that'll be a faster finish. Along with timing for market demand, what the plants want determines where they will finish. Sun lovers can go to the great outdoors. Others get protection under a shade cloth. As winter comes, cold tender perennials stay warm to entice adoption in spring. Since David grows year-round, he designed the greenhouses to handle every weather situation. In the wintertime, the, this house here is, is uh, heated just like a lot of houses up north would be. There's uh, hot water heat in the cement. And so we heat the roots and, and the, the heads stay cool. In the summertime, we roll up the sides. We're really blessed with uh, a nice wind out of the south every single day in the summer. And we put some shade on here. We, we use plastic that has um, um, a film on it that blocks the um, far red light, so that cuts down on the heat buildup. Even though they only grow what works in Texas, that's a wide range, from architectural foliage to seasonal perennial flowers that attract wildlife. And that's what I like, and I just like something kind of happening all the time. Not a big happening, just I like a little bit of color here and a little bit of color there, but I like it kind of continuous. They also have to think ahead, since it can take a year or more for a plant to be ready to sell. And propagating new vines means patient experimenting. That old theory of mine that you have to kill it two or three times before you know how to grow it. The work, the worry, and the long hot days are well worth it when they know a plant's on its way to a new home. To make somebody happy for doing a, a simple thing, it's kind of a nice feeling. And to spring life into something, that, it's not human life, but it's life all the same. To bring forth life is a real kick in the pants. We're going to switch gears a little bit right now, uh, move from where do plants come from, and we're going to be talking about where fruit comes from, because you know what? It can come from your own backyard. Joining me is Jim Camus. Uh, Jim is uh, the fruit specialist for Texas AgriLife Extension, and welcome back to Central Texas Gardener. Thanks very much, Tom. Hey, we are going to talk about a great topic right now. In fact, it's a red-hot topic in Texas gardening, uh, and maybe even nationwide, and that is home fruit production. Yes, it is. We have a lot of interest in people uh, wanting to grow their own fruit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there are a lot of different reasons for that. People want fresh food. They hear this term local food, and it can't get more local than your own backyard. That's right, and you know, and anybody uh, that has a home, it adds some permanence to your home to have something that's going to produce fruit uh, mm -hmm. over, over a long period of time. Yeah. Well, it's this kind of a sign of home in a way, too, to have that. And uh, we're going to be focusing on some un uh, varieties that people usually, when you talk about fruit trees here in Central Texas for decades, we've always started with peaches, things like that. This time, however, you're, you're steering us in a different direction. You want to talk about figs, pears, and pomegranates. Yes, I mean, there is some interest in, in some fruit crops that take a little bit of uh, either chemical or fertilizer inputs, and those are ones we found that we can grow with, with uh, uh, relative ease here in Central Texas. Well, you know, and I think that's also a, a big matter of concern is these are uh, very sustainable uh, fruit crops in that they require very little intervention in the way of chemicals and that sort of thing. Yes, we have a planting in Fredericksburg that's going into its third growing season. We've applied no fungicides, no insecticides, and no synthetic fertilizers. We're using all organic sources of nutrients, and uh, uh, they're doing all quite well. Oh, well, that's all great news, and I know that people love to hear it. Um, so why are we talking about fruit trees now at the beginning of January? Well, now's the time that people should uh, really be thinking about getting fruit trees in the ground. Uh, I mean, really, the best time to plant fruit trees would be in the fall, but you just don't really have the availability of containerized trees. Most fruit trees come and sold uh, from nurseries as bare root trees, and so they're typically dug, sorted, and then shipped in, in early to, to late winter to, for planting early spring. Is there an advantage if you can find a container grown one over the bare root I, I would kind of if it was just me I'd err on the side of a container grown tree absolutely because if you plant a container grown tree in the fall you have all fall and all winter for those roots to continue to grow mm -hmm. so in the spring when you have uh, bud break and the leaves start to come out you have an established root system to support that tree yeah but but a lot of these just aren't available that way no they're not I mean it's just it's a matter of shipping uh, mm -hmm. to, in order to transport a tree in, in a container it takes a considerable uh, more money 
uh, and you're mm -hmm. going to pay more for a containerized tree than a bare root tree. Okay. One thing that we have to discuss when we talk about fruit trees is pollinators. Um, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of fruit tree uh, species require a different variety of the same species to get pollination and actually a bare fruit. Correct. Peaches are pretty much self-pollinated. Plums, it depends on the variety. Uh, methylene and Santa Rosa are self-pollinated, but most of the others need another variety, as you mentioned, of a mm. similar chilling requirement to pollinate them. Apples and pears are traditionally considered to be cross-pollinated crops. Okay, so um, the pomegranates and figs, not to worry about that? Oh, pomegranates are self-pollinated, and actually the, what we call figs, we eat figs, are not fruit. They're strictly, the, the, we call it the fleshy mesocarp. We're eating the flower of the common fig, so pollination's not necessary. Ah, okay, well, I learned something new today, and that's a really cool. So um, in, in terms of uh, keeping this sustainable, low impact, What's the best fertilizer regimen for these trees that we're going to be talking about? Well, the biggest fertilizer need for all of these trees is going to be nitrogen. But the way we, we approach this in Fredericksburg, we actually had a very poor piece of soil uh, that we put up raised berms and we incorporated a tremendous amount of leaf litter that we got from, from the landfill. It was, it was free. We simply mm -hmm. had to pay for, for trucking. And uh, the deterioration of this organic matter has given us all the nitrogen we've needed. Right. So as you continue to top mulch to control weeds, mm -hmm. uh, that organic matter continues to decompose. And so far, we've had no need for uh, uh, organic or inorganic sources of nitrogen on uh, any of these crops. So just compost really and um, turning in the compost into your regular garden soils. Yes, and even trees that uh, are somewhat sensitive to high pH, uh, the more organic matter you add, uh, the more available iron and zinc, some of the, some of the less available mm -hmm. nutrients of high pH has become. Yeah. For fruit production, generally we're speaking, we're talking about plants that really do require full sun. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a tree is going to be somewhat leggy and it's not going to be very productive if it's in the shade. It, it, yeah. it, it may survive, but it won't be productive. Yeah, so just bear that in mind. If you've got a giant oak tree in your yard and you dream of uh, harvesting any of the things we're going to be talking about, probably not a good idea. Not a good idea. That oak tree was there first and it, it'll certainly <laughs> outcompete it for light and certainly water and nutrients as well. Okay, so um, low impact in terms of fertilizer, it sounds like. Um, uh, uh, basic uh, soil supplementation. If you have uh, a compost, turn that in. Maybe uh, uh, in, in caliche soils, uh, maybe breaking up some of that caliche even. If you have caliche soil, it is a good idea to break it up and, 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 and incorporate some of uh, some, uh, some compost or, or decomposed yeah. organic matter, certainly just to, to supplement the soil structure. I, you know, people often ask me on my radio show about uh, how come their fruit trees don't uh, bear well. And one of the f first things I say is, what's growing underneath of them? Yes. If they have lawn growing underneath, that really competes a lot with the trees. It does, and many times people water to meet the needs of the lawn and not necessarily a deeper watering to meet the need of the fruit trees, and the fruit trees will suffer. Yeah, so I, I, what I usually recommend is remove the grass and put down a lot of mulch or, or mulch blended with compost. Yes, at least to the drip line of the tree, from the trunk to the drip line is, is, is what we typically consider. It needs to be weed free, and, and the, the, you know, the, the compost will not only control weeds, but it will help uh, uh, control soil moisture. Okay, now a uh, final thing on the sustainability piece, the, the trees that we're going to be talking about, figs, pears, and pomegranates, I can't think of pests really that become a, a problem with them. Not really, you know, in some wet years we may have some fungal uh, pathogens, but we can typically control those uh, with uh, a dormant spray of copper sulfate, which is considered to be an organically approved compound. But no, we, that's just it. We, we have chosen these varieties because although we may have some, some insect activity, they're not a limiting factor to growing them. Yeah, and, and that's really different from, say, the peaches, for example. Peaches are pretty high, pretty high in, intensive spray input. Yes, they yeah. are. So, you know, if for people, and I'm, I'm one of those folks. I love peaches, love having them in the yard, but if I have to spray them, you know what, I'm not going to do it. Sure. You know, so let's let's spend some time now talking about these different varieties. Palm, I want to start with pomegranates because this is like the darling of the fruit world right now. And and, and there's some new varieties that are coming in from Central Asia that you were mentioning that sound really promising. Yes, it is. There's a lot of interest in pomegranates, even to the point of commercialization here in Texas. There are a number of people that are planting commercial commercial groves. Uh, we do have some new uh, uh, germplasm that's from Azerbaijan and, and northern Iran that uh, it not only incorporates good fruit quality, but also appears to be quite cold hardy. We had seven degrees Fahrenheit at our planting in Fredericksburg this year, and uh, we had any, any range of, of uh, winter injury from uh, total death frozen to the ground. But some of the varieties were completely untouched, and some of the soft-seeded 
uh, varieties uh, like Sunbar absolutely <clears throat> surprised us at seven degrees Fahrenheit didn't didn't touch them. At okay, now Sunbar is S U M B A R Sunbar. Is that actually commercially available yet? Well, we have people, some nurseries, just now starting to pick it up and mm -hmm. propagate it. So it'd probably be a year or two before uh, mm -hmm. they're in commercial trade. But if you see them, it's those are certainly ones that we uh, mm -hmm. suggest you put in and, and give them a try. If you wanted to actually grow a, a number of pomegranates, what kind of spacing would you put them in? We have ours uh, spaced at 16 feet between the rows, simply because that's the space it takes to get our tractor <laughs> and mower. But we have our tree spaced at 12 feet between, okay. between trees. That's going to be a pretty tight spacing, pretty dense uh, planting once they're okay. mature. Now, another tree that you're recommending are pears, and this is really, I, one, and everybody, old timers and here in Austin have always said, you want success with a fruit tree in, in Austin, plant a pear. Yes. What are your favorite varieties? Well, we, you know, kefir is kind of the standard variety that, that fire blight really everybody won't touch. Everybody loves it. It does, and if you mm -hmm. let it ripen well, I had some last week, they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. But we really have some very high quality uh, uh, French hybrid pears that can be grown here. Ayers and Warren are some that, you know, they're available in the nursery trade, but you don't hear people talking about much. And another one that I've discovered uh, is LeConte. Mm -hmm. And LeConte's another old variety, but my neighbor across the creek uh, uh, had some LeConte a couple of years ago, and I ate myself silly. They were just some of the best pears I've ever eaten. So okay. quite fire blight tolerant and, and very high quality. Okay, and you really can't go wrong with these trees. They, get, they, they can get big. And, and but this is and again speaking of sustainability, you typically don't need to prune the pears. No, no, you kind of bend the rules with pears because the more you fertilize them, the more vigorous they are, the more susceptible they are to fire blight. So we typically let the grass grow under it and we mow them. We don't fertilize them much. We don't water them a whole lot. Uh. So we want a nice slow-growing pear trees. But the one thing about being a pear grower, you have to be patient. Some of these varieties don't start bearing until they're eight or nine years old. Okay, all right. Now the figs, um, I, this is another fruit that has really come on in, uh, in terms of popularity in the grocery stores and other places. So I would imagine we're seeing uh, new varieties coming in on, on the fig side. Yes, we are. And uh, you know, the old standard varieties that we'd see here were Alma, Celeste, and Brown Turkey. Brown turkey is, is, was, was uh, cherished because after a year where it froze to the ground, it was the only one of those three that would come back and bear fruit that same year. Yeah. Uh, we have 42 different varieties of, of, of fig under uh, evaluation in Fredericksburg. Uh, we had, again, seven degrees Fahrenheit, took everything to the ground with our figs, but two-thirds of our varieties bore fruit this year. And so we have some, some new varieties that uh, are quite different in texture, quite different in flavor. And, it's just something uh, something unique to, to offer, the, offer the public. Well, I know people were, are going to enjoy uh, learning more about this, and they can do that through the websites that we're going to be touting on yes. our own. So uh, the, if the people want the complete list of those varieties, they can find that information there. For more information about fruit trees, including tips on varieties, fertilizing, and pruning, go to klru.org slash ctg. Jim, thank you so much for coming Thanks, on board. Tom. This is a great topic for, I know, lots of folks out there who are uh, really serious now about growing their own food. Well, uh, coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week comes from a great one from our viewer. Her name is Betty, and she has a brown turkey fig that every year in October, it loses its leaves. They shrivel and turn brown and then fall off of the plant. Last year, she cut the plant back to 12 inches from the ground, and it did grow back to lush eight feet tall. Then the leaves scorched and dropped off again. So she wants to know what's going on with her fig. Well, this sounds to me like fig rust, which is a fungal disease that unfortunately will likely return and must be managed. With all fungal diseases, you should definitely remove the affected plant material from the ground and keep the area very clean. So those, those leaves that scorch and fall off, you need to rake them up immediately and toss them out. Rust is most easily controlled with a neutral copper spray, product lists such as copper hydroxide or copper sulfate. One or two applications made in May or early June usually keeps these trees in fairly good condition until after the fruit ripens. In very wet seasons, one or two additional applications may be necessary. A good index for spraying is when the first leaves on the tree have reached their full size. So go ahead and treat preventatively at that time if you've had a problem with fungal rust in the past. The second spray should then follow in three to four weeks after that, and in excessively wet seasons, three to four weeks after that again. It's extremely important to get good leaf coverage with this spray material. But copper is fatal to bees, one of Betty's concerns. So do be judicious in spraying it, 
or if you have a real concern about that, consider removing the plants entirely and starting with a totally different shrub. Our plant this week is Swiss chard. This plant looks great and it's edible, so it's wonderful in your garden. You can plant transplants now, or you, can, you still have time to direct seed these into your garden. This is one of our most easy cool season vegetables. It does prefer cool weather, but it can also tolerate freezes and even some of our heat. It loves full sun, but it can take a little bit of shade. You need to water it well in the summer and harvest only the leaves that you need when you want to eat them. It will produce more leaves and may live for several seasons if you harvest judiciously. If it bolts, which means if it produces a flower stalk, you need to remove that to encourage leaf production. That will keep the flowers from producing seeds and so keep the leaves producing for you and keep the plant from dying, which it will do after it bolts. This plant is ready to harvest in about 60 days after you've seeded it. And good varieties for our area are bright lights and rainbow. To do this week in your garden, add some manure or compost to your vegetable beds for the spring season if you have no plants in them now. Manure does need three months to age in the soil so that it won't burn your plants when you plant them soon. Compost needs at least a month, but it's, your plants are less sensitive to that than they are to manure. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. One of my favorite fruit trees is the persimmon tree. It's super easy to grow and there are persimmons that are very small and so they can fit into any yard and they have very few pest problems. You don't have to do a lot of spraying. The wood is very hard. In fact, it was used to make wood iron golf clubs for many years and still is. And since it's so strong, borer damage is just not something that you have with those. So uh, if you are into low input tr fruit trees, persimmons are a good uh, tree and many of the varieties varieties are fruitful or self-fruitful. They don't need a pollinator and they produce a lot of fruit in a very short time. You often have 30 to 40 fruit on a tree by its second year and uh, before too long you are inundated with uh, persimmons and uh, that can be a nice thing. Now uh, there are different sizes of fruit. One of the most productive trees is the Tani Nashi which is these uh, smaller fruit here but the Fuyu is a good one. Chia is another one that I've had great success with here. And when you harvest your persimmons, you can harvest them while they're still quite hard. And you always want to make sure that you're getting the calyx too when you cut it from the tree. Sometimes it's best just to go ahead and cut the little branch with it. And you may have to use a basket to harvest them when they're hard. It's a little bit tricky to harvest them when they start to get soft on the tree because they bruise so easily. And that's one reason why we don't see persimmons in grocery stores that often, except for the very firm persimmons and those aren't really my favorites to eat. Now I like to just put them on a tray or in a basket where they're in a single layer and bring them indoors from October and November before they're quite soft. Now if you eat them when they're hard they're very astringent. They have a lot of tannins and they taste bad cold weather or time will develop those, uh, will make those tannins break down so that they're not astringent tasting, but they almost have a chalky flavor if you eat one when they're bad. And I promise you, you will think that you don't like persimmons if you eat them that way. They really need to have almost a jelly or a pudding-like consistency before you eat them. And so when one is soft, soft enough so that you actually can leave a fingerprint in the side of the persimmon, then that's a soft ripe persimmon and it won't be astringent. Now, uh, like I said, there are some like tamapan that can be eaten when they're firm and are not astringent, but uh, these are the astringent variety. So once they start to get soft, they can be refrigerated for about five to seven days and then they go bad very quickly. So it's nice to have some ways to preserve and store them. One of the things I like to do is take a persimmon and just slice off slices 
pieces, put it on parchment paper, put it on a uh, cookie sheet, put that in the freezer until all the slices are very frozen. You want the slices to not be touching as it goes into the freezer. Then once they're frozen, you can put them in a baggie or a, a plastic container and take out a few slices, put them in a smoothie, a papaya, I mean, a pineapple and persimmon smoothie is one of my very favorites. And I'll be putting the recipe for that on the website. You can also make a delicious persimmon ice cream very quickly in your food processor with cream, sugar, and the persimmon slices, and that also will be on our website. And then you can take the persimmon pulp from Ripe Persimmons and just put that in a container. I like to add a little lemon juice to it so that it doesn't discolor, but then this could be used for pulp in breads and cookies and all kinds of baked goods, and it keeps them very nice and moist and fresh. And then the easiest way to store your excess persimmons is just to take the ripe persimmons and put them in a freezer bag and store them in the freezer whole. Once they come out of the freezer. They're very soft and, and ready to use, and you can easily harvest the pulp and separate it from the seeds. So you can enjoy persimmons all year long from the fruits of your harvest in the fall. Visit klru.org ctg to watch online and check out our resources. Next week, take a look at design templates to use at home. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org ctg.